Greetings, one and all, and welcome back to the SitRep Podcast, your source for historical wargaming. I'm your host, Oriskany Jim, and today we're going uh, to get back a little bit to our roots, uh, just a little bit, with some uh, modern historical wargaming. We've been doing a lot of World War II lately, and there's, there is more to come, uh, to be fair. With the 80th anniversaries that we've been following, we're getting waist deep in a very, very busy uh, stretch of activity. Uh, the Solomon Islands, Stalingrad, El Alamein, these campaigns were all taking place at the exact same time in different parts of the world. The back end of 1942 is really where the, really where the whole show you know, finally turns around. But like I said, for today, we're going to get back to some moderns, and we also wanted to show our friends in the UK a little love. I mean, they've had a tough week. Let's, uh, let's be real. Um, so hence our topic. I realize that it's now past midnight where they are. So, you know, most of them are probably not going to be watching right now, but um, they can check it out later. And the materials that we're going to be building today will be used in a 1991 Gulf War demo game that we're running Sunday uh, much earlier in the afternoon at a much you know more agreeable hour. So the system we're going to be working with is... Tactical Command, Middle East. Uh, this is published by a company called Toshash Miniatures. And it's basically an offshoot of Avalon Hill's classic Panzer Blitz system. Uh, I might also add, I think it's Tactical Combat Middle East, not Tactical Command. I think I, give them, I, got, I, think I got the name wrong. So this game is available if you want to uh, buy it on PDF. Uh, we do modify it a little bit. We sort of bring back in some of the... Arab Israeli wars and Panzer leader rules. So, for the, anyone who's not familiar, Panzer Blitz is the first game that comes out. Then comes, air quotes, second edition. That's Panzer Leader. Same basic game, with some cleanup. Now moved over to the Western Front of World War II. Panzer Blitz technically was strictly Eastern Front. And then Arab Israeli wars. They brought in a new team. They completely rewrote the rules. It's still the same system, but they really fix a lot of the initial problems. And of course, it deals with the Arab Israeli wars of 56, 67, and 73. They play around with 82 a little bit, the invasion of Lebanon, but the game came out before that took place. So at the time, it was speculative fiction. And then later on, uh, Toshash Miniatures came out with Tactical Combat Middle East, which is for, it's basically Pains or Blitz, so it goes back to first edition, but then it updates it uh, a great deal for the uh, 1991 and 2003 Gulf Wars. Um, so Desert Storm and Iraqi Freedom. Now, again, it's it's DNA. It's based back on that first edition Panzer Blitz system. So we do want to get some of that uh, Panzer Leader and especially Arab Israeli Wars uh, stuff kind of worked back into it. So it's going to be a little bit of a blend here. Oh no, someone's offended. Uh, that is not a pretty tank on the thumbnail. That's a Challenger 1, man. Come on. Jen, the whole point of the stream is to be nice to the British, and you're going to call the Challenger 1 ugly? Come on. Challenger 1 um, is actually a beautiful tank because it looks a lot like an Abrams, and I love the Abrams. But uh, in all seriousness, Christopher Keith is offended. <laughs> um, I tell you what, uh, whether or not you like the way the tank looks or not, you're uh, hopefully you'll like the numbers because this tank is a serious badass, uh, as we're, we're about to see. So, um, we've gone through this a little bit in the past. I won't bore you with all these details, but we do have a spreadsheet that we've been working on in the past. We have a series of uh, episodes on our channel previously called um, How the Sausage is Made, because we were constantly bombarded with questions. I shouldn't say bombarded. It's actually kind of flattering, but we're constantly getting questions about you know how you come up with these numbers and so on and so forth because again the game is in world war ii and then arab israeli wars okay it kind of pushes it to 1973 how do you get 1980s full the gap scenarios british army of the rhine scenarios you know the soviets and all their pals and the warsaw pact are invading west germany scenarios gulf war scenarios in 91 iraqi freedom in 2003 we've done speculative ukraine versus russia before it actually happened. In fact, we did it six years before it happened. Um, we caught some flack for doing that. Uh, I think now we've been vindicated a little bit on that regard. And, um, you know, the Soviets are, I should say, the Russians invade the Baltics, uh, speculative uh, Chinese invasions of Taiwan, all using this system. 
And basically we take the size of the gun. Uh, it gets a base number based basically on how many millimeters it is, the caliber of the weapon, the training of the crew, it's ammunition, rate of fire, electronics, and we come up with all the others. So there's formulas in here that calculate a final value, and then we sort of fidget around with it a little bit there. Basically, I don't like odd numbers on my counters because they're tougher to divide. Um, then you have to round off and all this other stuff. There's a lot of d dividing things in half in Panzer Leader, and there's a lot of multiplying things by two in Panzer Leader. So, again, I don't want to bore everybody to tears, especially since we've already gone over all this stuff. People have seen this spreadsheet before. This is how we get our numbers. We're not just guessing. Um, so, there, there is a bit of a formula to it. All right. So, with that out of the way, hopefully this will work. Okay. So, here is one of our maps. People also ask us a great deal about our maps. Um... This is how we make our apps. We make them in basically in Photoshop. Now, right now, I'm technically using Photo P. It's a browser-based, it's a free, really, free browser-based, uh, what's the word, uh, sort of approximation of Photoshop. It's like, you know, Photoshop for beginners. Uh, it doesn't have nearly as much functionality as real Photoshop, but it's free. So, uh, this is just good for this computer. All my Photoshop, my real Photoshop licenses, my software is on another computer that is way too old to be streaming at any kind of decent quality. So it's tough for me to stream and Photoshop at the same time. So I use Photo P and again, we're not creating like original artwork here. Uh, we're just building some maps and building some counters. So long story short, Photo P is good enough. Okay, so for anyone who might not be familiar, um, Panzer, the whole Panzer, I'm just going to call it the Panzer Leader family. Again, Panzer Blitz, Panzer Leader, Arab Israeli Wars, Tactical Combat, Middle East. All these games are all work on the same basic system. I'm just going to call it like the Panzer Leader family. So Panzer Leader works on what is basically a platoon system. If you're dealing with a Soviet force, you or a Soviet design force, like any of our client states, the Iraqis, for example, in 1991 Gulf War, we are going to be, the, it's more like a half company uh, kind of a system. Long story short, take your however many shots it's been. You gotta take a shot every time I say long story short. Except, no you don't, because the amount by which I overuse and abuse that phrase, you'll be in the hospital within an hour. So don't do that. <laughs> the Sit Rep Podcast claims no responsibility for medical conditions brought on by playing the long story short drinking game. But in all seriousness, um, it's a platoon level game. So every piece on that goes on the table is a platoon of five tanks, or really four tanks in modern times, a platoon or troop of four tanks, um, say 30 to 50 infantry, if it's an infantry platoon, or a battery of four to six guns is generally how it works. Now, again, when you take it over to the Soviet side or the Soviet trained and, and you know Soviet organized side, they tend to organize in three tank platoons. So three platoons of three tanks plus a, ta plus a uh, company commander, you wind up with 10 tanks. So there you're dividing the company in half. It's basically five tanks per half company. So uh, again, roughly four to five tanks, 30 to 40 men, and so on. So when you see one of these big games where we have like, you know, 100 counters on the map, yeah, you have to, to multiply that by five. And oh, there's 500 tanks on this table. You know, this is um, a game where the hexes are 150 meters or 250 meters across. If you do the math, that comes out to either a six foot or eight foot, roughly, uh, 15 millimeter table. So if you're a fan of Team Yankee or Seven Days to the River Rhine, that's generally the size of the table. And some of these boards are 40 or 50 hexes across. So again, it's platoon based, but it's as far as like the level of the game, it's at least regiment a full regiment, if not a brigade. I've played around with divisional size games now and then. Sometimes that's fun, but yeah, pack a lunch and eat your Wheaties because you're going to be at it for a nice, you know, 10 or 12 hour game. So um, for today, we're going to go ahead and I think I sense a Christmas present in Jim's future. Uh oh, I don't need Photoshop, Jen. I've got Photoshop. In fact, I've got it twice. I just don't have it on a machine that streams terribly well, so it's all good. All right, so, so again, the map and the counters. We're just basically going to start drawing some counters. 
So, and what we're going to be building here specifically is a force uh, relevant to um, the 1991 goal form as we see with the British. So here's our template. We have the British camouflage pattern of the day. Um, here in this little background band, we have, of course, the British flag, or the UK flag, I should say, to be technical. Um, you do have to watch out for that. This flag does change right around, I think, uh, 1800 or late 1790s, something like that. So if you're, a, like, if you're like me and you're a fan of the American Revolution, you have to be careful not to put the UK flag on your table instead of the British flag. And there are differences. They are missing the um, cross of St. Patrick. Um, so this is kind of a combination of three flags as I'm sure everyone who lives in the UK knows. So I won't bore everybody with that. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and remove this. And then from here on out, guys, it's literally just a bunch of pre-made um, assets that I've either made or borrowed. And um, we just sort of start making these, these counters in a template. Today's stream, again, is a relatively unplanned stream, kind of a bonus content thing. It's not a big deal. We're not going to be on for more than an hour or so. Um, I know I always say that. But, um, yeah. So, what are we going to start with here? Well, there's a lot to build. I, we certainly won't build everything in today's stream. But just for fun, let's start with the FV-510. Or some people call it the MCV-80. Well, either way, you, however you want to cut it, it's the uh, it's the Warrior APC. All right, so there's our template. I have all my vehicles facing to the right because the majority of the action that first UK armored, especially Seventh Armored uh, Brigade, conducted in uh, Desert Storm or Operation Granby, I think as the British called it, uh, was moving from left to right losing from west to east again that was part of schwarzkopf's big left hook and we'll go into all the all the background of the battle and stuff like that in sunday stream where we'll actually be demo playing this game but i just want to show you know why we oops wrong tool um why we are showing our counters pointing uh, a certain direction it doesn't matter there's no facing in this game it's a platoon so all platoons are always facing in all directions there's no like flank armor really in this game a tactical command middle east does sort of play with that rule a little bit some other games like uh, gdw assault definitely gets into facing and formation but it doesn't matter when it comes to the silhouette of the unit basically i want my maps to make sense when i set up a game board all the enemy tanks are pointing at each other so iraqis are mostly pointing to um, the left and allies coalition are mostly pointing to the because that's how most of the combat was taking place. It was from uh, west to east. All right, so the silhouette is already there. All right, sometimes people ask, why don't I use color silhouettes? Well, the silhouette is what is standard in Panzer Leader, Panzer Blitz, Panzer Leader, Average Really Wars always used a black silhouette. And again, in real life, these counters are five eighths of an inch across, um, especially if you use, like I do, um, a camouflage uh, banner to help identify nationality, you're not gonna be able to see it. You're gonna lose all that detail by the time you print it, mount it, and uh, put it on the table at five eighths of an inch. So, yeah. Number one, uniformity with the rest of the system. And number two, it, it would almost be a, a waste of effort. So the um, Warrior, let me look at my notes here, gets an eight in attack class. So that's the factor by which it attacks enemy units with. Okay, no worries there. Uh, it's a 30 millimeter automatic cannon. So it does get more than a 30 millimeter cannon does because like I said, it's a, uh, um, what was I gonna say? It is uh, an automatic cannon. You're never getting hit with just one shell. The armor, uh, the armor, I should say the armament class or the weapons class is very important in Panzer Leader. Panzer Leader comes down to basically four numbers. Um, where the complexity comes in is this weapons class. So you got to keep an eye on that. It's an armor piercing weapon. Armor piercing weapons in Panzer Leader normally divide by two when attacking anything unarmored. So anti-tank guns, missile positions, bunkers, buildings, infantry positions, slit trenches. Whenever you're attacking anything that isn't made out of metal, you have to divide an armor rating, you have to divide this number in half. What the star means is that this is an automatic cannon, 
where it has special ammunition, where you get to uh, bypass that rule. So when this a weapon is attacking soft targets like enemy infantry, as you can imagine, the 30 millimeter automatic cannon does a pretty good job on enemy infantry, soft skin vehicles. It doesn't have to suffer that half attack penalty that other A-class weapons do. Uh, the range as a 30 millimeter cannon is pretty good. Again, the scale is usually 250 meter hexes. So when I put in 10, that's about 2,500 meters. Sometimes I play with 150 meter hexes. That comes out to uh, uh, that comes out to about 1,500 meters. Again, once you get past half your range, you're going to be um, dividing in half anyway. So it's pretty effective out to 750 meters, out to uh, 1,500 meters. It's eh, it's still pretty good. It'll take care of trucks, BTRs, and stuff like that. Okay, one thing I'm not a big fan of is the spacing on those letters. So we're going to fix that really quick. Because that one and that zero look too far apart. So give me a second to squish those together. Okay, that looks a little bit better. Now this 10 and this 10 kind of match. Okay, speaking of which, we now will go down to the defense. This is the armor rating of the unit. Uh, the Warrior, like a lot of APCs, not the best armored uh, vehicle in the world, to be perfectly honest. Um, we're giving it a 12 in this system. That cannot be right. Is that right? Uh, that's better than a Sherman tank. I'll have to look this up later, but that's, uh -oh, that's a little too high. I'll come back to that later, guys. We may we may be modifying that later. Um, however, it does do a decent, like just short of 20 miles, uh, just short of 40 miles an hour, or about 60, 65 kilometers an hour. So we give it that speed. Again, that's in um, 250 meter hexes. So they're quick. They're not as quick as like a Bradley or an Abrams. Uh, the British doesn't put that high of, a, of an emphasis on armored speed until you get down to the whole uh, scorpion family which you're going to get to but other than that they're actually kind of uh, they're not they're not they're not they're not the fastest vehicles uh, on the battlefield all right so fv let me get this right oh wait never mind um what do we call this again i know it's the warrior i'm trying to get the official air quotes fv 510 FV510 Warrior. Check something super quick. Guys, don't mind. This is some of my Russian stuff, by the way. Um, ba -ba -ba -ba. Yeah, okay, I'm using all capital letters. Okay, cool. Um, I might change this later if you come back to, uh, on Sunday stream and you see this value has changed. Um, it might get jacked up a little bit. I'm going to have to do some research about how thick a Warrior's armor actually was. And more importantly, what it was made out of. Uh, once you get past like 1960 or so, the thickness of the armor doesn't mean anything. Uh, it's not World War II anymore. It's whether or not it's homogenous steel. It's whether or not it's laminate. It's whether or not it's ceramic, chobum, some kind of nylon micro mesh. Uh, then you get reactive armor. You get explosive armor panels, and it, it gets insane. By the time you get into the 2010s, you're talking about. Um, active engagement defensive systems where the tank actually has a tiny radar on top of it and it detects incoming rockets and missiles and launches a piece of its own armor out to meet the incoming uh, self-propelled warhead uh, and explodes it before it even reaches the tank. So it's almost like a counter engagement interception weapon at that point. Um, did these not mount to Milan? Uh, Christopher Keith, you're a little bit ahead of the class. Short answer is sometimes. And we're going to get to that in just a second. Okay, so here is, uh, to answer your question, uh, Christopher, great question, by the way. This is the warrior without the, um, the Milan anti-tank kind of weapon. So we are going to go ahead and export this as a, it's got to be a PNG. Because later on, this is going to go over top of the map. The map is going to be put into Excel spreadsheet. And then the counters get put into an Excel spreadsheet it's floating over top of the map. So in order to have this cool little um, shadow effect, so it looks like a 3D counter, 
Uh, or at least it looks like a piece of cardboard sitting on a real light, uh, real um, game map. It's got to be a PNG. As opposed to a JPEG. Oh, I got to find the right folder. Uh, spare me a second. Sorry, guys. Let me... I know you guys didn't come out here to watch me navigate around my incredibly... Uh... All right, cool. So we're going to call this, uh, obviously it's UK, and we're going to call it uh, Warrior. And we'll just call it the Warrior for now. All right, cool. Now we're going to make two variants of this counter super fast. Uh, go away. Okay, number one is exactly what Christopher is talking about. Some warriors do carry uh, the Milan anti-tank missile. Oof. I got to update the spacing on this here a little bit. Okay. So now it's A star slash G. That's a lot of information. Oh, shoot. I forgot something. Sorry, guys. I forgot the most important job. I literally just committed a Bradley mistake. I forgot what an APC is actually supposed to do. Talk about the guys who uh, commissioned and built the Bradley back in the 1980s. It's supposed to carry infantry, guys. So there's a small C next to the weapons class that denotes that it gets to carry infantry. And we'll get to infantry counters in a little bit. So excuse me for my quick mistake there. We're just going to go ahead and re-export and replace this one because it's wrong. Yes, I want to replace it. All right, cool. Now let's move forward. Nope. It's the wrong text object. Okay, so what we're going to do here is put in a slash C. And, uh, sorry, a slash G. G means it also gets to make guided weapon attacks. And uh, that's where you get the Milan. The Milan, like most um, weapons of that generation, usually have an attack class of about 40... Well, the Sagar has a 30 and a range of 12. That's right out of Arab's early wars. I didn't make up those numbers. Um, based on that, also Arab's early wars gives the toe a 50 slash 20. So what I tend to do is give other comparable weapon systems like the Milan, the Hot, or, um, yeah, that's pretty much it, the Milan and the Hot. A, um, and I know what you're about to mention. Give me a second. Uh, the Milan and the Hot, I tend to give them similar uh, statistics as the Toe. They're all generally the same. Um, 50 attack, G armor cla uh, weapons class, and 20 range. So about 5 kilometers. Based on 250 meter hexes, every 4 hexes is a kilometer. So it, you know, it works out uh, pretty easy. Um, however, as we're going to see when we get to our uh, Scorpion series, we have weapons like the swing fire, which I believe the range was kind of similar and the accuracy was still pretty similar. It's warhead though was a lot bigger. Um, I had an old book in the 1980s called, you know, tank busters, any kind of anti-tank weapon you can think of. And it had this big table and it listed all the penetration range. Of course, the numbers were absurd because it assumed optimum range, 90 degree hits on rolled homogenous steel plate no lamination, no reactive armor, no chobum, no nothing. At 90 degree angles, a perfect range. So it was like 600 millimeters of armor, it'll penetrate. 800 millimeters of armor, it'll 850 millimeters of armor, it'll, it'll penetrate. It got to the swing fire, it didn't give you a number. It said all known armor. You get hit by a swing fire, you're dead. So usually I crank the swing fire up to about a 55 or 60. Um, that puts it on par with things like the American Maverick or Hellfire, um, which you can't launch from a ground system. You have to launch that from an A-10 or a uh, Apache. All right, so now this weapon or this vehicle does carry uh, a, a G-Class. What that G-Class actually is depends on the scenario, and that's going to be put in the scenario special rules. Spoiler alert, it's usually a Milan, and then that's going to be um, 50... G20. But I can't put, you know, this 8 and 10 is for the autocannon. There's only so many spaces for numbers. Um, so that G just reminds you, hey, this thing gets to fire missiles only once. 
This is like the Bradley. It fires two missiles, like the Bradley for example, fires two missiles out of a side boom, and then it has to pull back and do what's called a reload drill, or a missile drill. You gotta basically get out of the vehicle and reload the missiles, and it really only carries the one extra set, one or two extra sets. Then you get to the M3, Calvary Bradley, where everything stays the same, except it says G+. And you know what it doesn't have? It doesn't have the C. Because it can't carry troops. It's a cavalry vehicle. Basically all the space inside the vehicle to carry all those extra, uh, all those troops, it devotes to missiles instead. So you're gonna see something like this if we ever show Bradley's again, which we've shown before um, in multiple games. And that's gonna be the difference between an M2 and an M3 Bradley, if anyone ever asks. Basically, extra missile load and expensive troops. At the expense of carrying troops, I should say. However, the Warriors do carry troops. Um, that's the good news. The British do actually remember what an APC is for, unlike some people in the Pentagon. And um, so it does get the C rule. However, it only gets one game shot. Again, this is, a, this is a platoon level game. Combat is usually between six and 10 minutes. So when you roll the dice to hit, you're not rolling for one shot. This isn't like, uh, you know, Team Yankee, Bolt Action, Seven Days to the River Rhine. This is a unit taking a sustained fire on an enemy group of vehicles for an extended period of time. So a fire phase uses up all its missiles. So that completes that counter. Again, we're going to export SPNG. And we're going to call this Warrior dash ATGM. All right, awesome. All right, we're gonna make one more slight adjustment to this thing. We are actually, all right, hold on. Let me get on the right damn thing here. We're gonna get rid of the missiles. See, the problem with modern wargaming isn't that there's too many vehicles. There's really only very few actual combat vehicle types out there, but there's like 20 versions of everything. All right, and we're going to stay with me. Knock that down to four. Range remains the same. And we're going to knock the defense down to five. So what this is, is a headquarters. This is a command vehicle, um, which usually only operates in two tank sections or two track sections to be technical as opposed to four tank troops in the british military or two or four tank uh platoons in the uh, in the american military so basically it gets half the firepower because it's half as many vehicles and two-thirds of the attack uh, of the defense factor um the reason it doesn't go all the way down to half oh it's half as many vehicles that's carrying twice, half as much armor it, it doesn't really work that way uh, we've got two, again, when one unit fires at another unit in Panzer Leader, what you're doing is this group of five or 10 or 20 or however many get units you're shooting at once in groups of five is shooting at another group. It's the law of averages. So you get defense credit, so to speak, based not only on the thickness of your armor, the composition of your armor, but also how small a target you are. The bigger you are, the worse your defense factor. You can look at all kinds of vehicles through Panzer Blitz and Panzer Leader, and I'll show you this. Um, the KV-1, for example, uh, if you go into early war in Russia, the KV-1, I think, has a defense factor of 12. The KV-2, which is actually heavier armored, it carries more metal, defense factor of 10, because it's 15, 16 feet tall. Same thing happens with the Americans when they bring in uh, the uh, Grant and Lee, uh, the early M3 Grant and Lee tanks. Damn thing's like 14 feet tall and it's riveted construction in some parts of it. So yeah, its armor is gonna be pretty bad because again, it's also a big target. A unit, again, it's not a vehicle, it's a unit. A unit of two vehicles is harder to spot than a unit of four vehicles. So they don't get cut straight in half um, when it comes to uh, their defense factor. Range, the gun still shoots out to the same range, just with half as many uh, barrels and the, the unit still moves at the same speed. So no worries there. Hopefully that makes uh, a little bit of sense. 
Uh, I want to export. Export, please. And yeah, we just start building this up. Uh, now give me this for the name and HQ. The good news is once you make a certain type of vehicle and you save it in your archive, and then your scenario calls for 20, you don't have to make 20 counters. You just insert the one into your spreadsheet, control C, control V 20 times, blah, 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 and boom, you have a friggin' division in about 10 seconds. Um, however, when it comes to virtual gaming, um, you do have to do a little bit of, uh, there's a bit of lead time to the work. There is some uh, stuff you gotta do. Math, boys and girls, it's not just for school. No, man. Uh, <laughs> what was that movie? It's like, this is it. Uh, it's something to do with Mars. Yeah, they're, they're trying to figure out how to get somewhere, and they have to use, like, geometry and trigonometry to, to figure it out. And because uh, all they have is, like, a series of grid references. And uh, one of the uh, astronauts laments, yeah, they warned us, this is it, the time algebra would save your life. Um, math, especially geometry, reading a grid reference in the military, let me tell you something. You don't want to make those mistakes. you got to get your arithmetic correct. And for a big operational game, or not really operational, a big command tactical game like Panzer Leader, yeah, you want to have your math straight. All right, so um, we've already been up for a good brief, about 30 minutes. Uh, oh, where is a voice recorder when you need one? Uh, this is a sound effect I wish you could have on call. I'm not sure what you're talking about. Oh, um, you're talking about that quote from that movie? I think I know what movie it is. Um, Red Planet or what, Mission to Mars or something. We'll talk about it later. It wasn't, no, no, it wasn't, it, it was a movie like that, but it wasn't Matt Damon. I know the big famous line from uh, Matt Damon. We're going to science the shit out of this. This was, they were trying to get to a hab that was already on the surface. The spaceship crashed, and now they were like 50 kilometers away from the crash site, and they had to get there. They didn't have maps, but they had certain, um, um, landmarks and they had a sort of trigonometry their way you know to there and they had enough oxygen to last them like a certain number of hours so they couldn't pass it they couldn't go in the wrong direction they wouldn't have time to search for this they had to shoot an azimuth and it had to be right the first time um it might have been the one with val kilmer in it i'm actually not sure there's 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 a few of them um I don't think it was the one with Gary Sinise. Anyway. Uh, click off on that. Okay, so uh, we're going to sort of, before we get to the fun part, we're going to play around. And we're going to do Old Reliable. The F-101 Scorpion. Or the FV-101 Scorpion. Oops, that's right, all caps. All right, so there's a whole list of uh, vehicles, and we won't be using them all, and I'm certainly not going to make them all on the stream. We would be here for like another hour, but just to list them off real quick, we have the F-101, FV, sorry, uh, 101 Scorpion. That's the the base of the line, so to speak. The FV-102 Striker, that carries, again, uh, that one carries the Swing Fire anti-tank missile. So, and it only carries Swing Fire anti-tank missiles. It's not an APC. They take the infantry out. So that thing, um, yeah, gets a G plus, and again, it's firing those 60-point swing fires. It's pretty badass. Um, it's a tiny little vehicle. If it gets hit, it's dead. But it's a glass cannon uh, until it gets hit. FV-103 is the Spartan APC. The 104 is the Samaritan Armored Ambulance. Uh, we probably won't be using any of those. Um, Pain's Leader doesn't really have Kazavak uh, rules or anything like that. FE-105 is the Sultan Armored Command Vehicle. We will definitely be using those. FE-106, the Samson Armored Recovery Vehicle for the engineers. And FE-107 is the Scimitar Armored Reconnaissance Vehicle. So there's seven variants of the, uh, at least, seven variants of the Scorpion line. And there's a lot going on. All right, so this is the base boilerplate Scorpion. Um, it's kind of a funny little vehicle. Uh, it's not going to be the toughest thing on the table, I'm not going to lie. It does carry... Oh, I hate when it does that. Uh, give me a second. I have to fix this negative 80. 
Make that 100. That's good. All right, cool. Um, it's got a 76 millimeter gun on it, not unlike the BMP-1. Um, I'm sure the ammunition is made a little bit better, so it's going to have a better range. But it's not like an automatic cannon or anything, to my knowledge. So it's not going to get that star on its uh, attack. And the Scorpion does not carry troops, to my knowledge. Again, other members of this vehicle family do. Uh, the range on this bad boy is... Yeah, 10, that's already correct. The defense... Uh, yeah, these are really small vehicles. Defense on this thing is a 4. And the speed, however, is fast. Uh, this is the exception to the rule I was mentioning before, where the British Army doesn't tend to like fast tanks. Um, it's the equal to the early American Abrams. I, I stress early American Abrams. The Abrams they make nowadays don't move at this speed. They, lo they loaded them up with too much tusk, tank urban survival kit, too much HA, heavy armor, too much of that depleted uranium uh, armor crap they put in there. It's, uh, the, the tank has, has needs to go on a diet. Uh, the tank has gotten fat in her old age. The M1 Abrams, uh, they're down, way down from their former top speed of 45 miles an hour. But 45 miles an hour, again, I think this comes out to like 42. It's usually three, uh, for every three miles per hour, um, I give it three points, so 42, and you know, I bump it up a little. All right, and this is the F-101 Scorpion. We're all set. This is the uh, Scorpion in more of its uh, light tank uh, configuration. Uh, I don't mean to get, you know, super anal with my titles and my files here, but uh, Scorpion. It makes it easier when you have to build a scenario later. Okay. Again, this uh, vehicle has a lot of other versions that are pretty cool. Uh, I have them all kind of pre-made over here, so you guys don't have to watch me, uh, you know, make these time after time. All right, so here's basically the same vehicle. What they've done is they've removed the turret and they've replaced it with a swing fire anti-tank guided weapon mount. So it doesn't carry any gun. It goes straight to the 60. And now I have to... The, the spacing between the letters gets screwed up when there's a 1. Is what's happening there. There we go. Um, it, I mean, it carries a machine gun, but that doesn't really... That's not really important. What it really carries is those swing fires. And uh, fortunately for it, it carries an unlimited supply of them in game terms. Uh, the range on these bad boys is 20. Which means I'm going to have to respace this um, number field again. Negative 20. Okay. Uh, speed is still... Uh, the armor is still 4. And the um, speed is still 14. By the way, if there's anybody who knows about this stuff, like reliably, and I do mean reliably, not like Wikipedia, reliable. Um, I know our community has a lot of British Army veterans in it. I doubt they're watching now because I know it's, it's a weird time in the UK right now. I do apologize for that. But again, the game that we're going to be using these counters in is going to be played Sunday, probably starting at 1 Eastern US time, which is 6 p.m. your time in the UK. So hopefully... Uh, you know, we'll be able to have a better audience then. Well, we got a pretty good audience now, especially for a surprise stream. Another historian wargamer has joined us. We could always invent case of egg rules and turn a seven hour game into a 12 hour game. Um, Dylan, you're talking like I don't play 12 hour um, Panzer Leader games. Ask Damon and um, Andrew, uh, Bruce Lee and Damon. Uh, we did all, well, not all, we did half of Gold Beach the uh god i'm so dyslexic the um western side so i think that's jig sector yeah there's jig and king sector of uh, gold beach we did all of it down to the last historical detail in platoon level like the first 12 hours of the invasion and it, well, the first six hours of the invasion and it took nine and a half hours we did it all in one stream uh a 12-hour game we did first marine division uh, in this same gulf war uh, that was a 12-hour game, and the biggest Spanish leader game I've run in recent memory was all 
both divisions, 29th Infantry and the 1st Infantry, uh, uh, Big Red 1. So that's 16th and 116th Regimental Combat Teams landing on the entirety of Omaha Beach. Took 25 hours. Of course, we didn't do it in one stretch because um, that would be insane. Uh, springtime says, um, will you call the Challenger 1, the Challenger Mark 5, I believe it was called in the 90s? Uh, I'm going to call it the Challenger 1 because that's the name most people know. And this will get expanded later into more modern, like 2003, and then Speculative Wars in the future as the Challenger 2. So sometimes the, the name of the vehicle will change. We have to go with whatever is most clear. Um, this happens uh, when we get to the, M, uh, the M109 Paladin. I mean, the M109 Paladin has been around since the 80s, obviously. Uh, actually, no, it's been around since the late 60s. But how long it's been called the Paladin, there's uh, you know, a certain degree of debate. Uh, the M227 or the MLRS, you know, people use different names. Uh, we might be able to fit both of them on here um, when we get to it. The long story short is we go with what is most, even if it's not always technically accurate, we go with what's most, uh, with, 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 what, with what is most commonly known and clear. This becomes a nightmare, by the way, uh, to your point, um, in World War II when you're designing counters for the Sherman. Because, I mean, how many versions of a Sherman are there? And what do the British call it? Like, there's no such thing as the Sherman III in the American military. It's the M4A2E whatever, you know, and so on. So you have to be careful with the naming convention. It's better to just stick with what's kind of basic and known. Everyone knows it. Um, and what's clear. So this takes care of the export below, export as. Uh, thanks very much, everybody, for coming out. I'm surprised we got uh, this great of an audience uh, for a, a weird day. We normally don't stream on Fridays. UK Warrior. Uh, no, it's not a Warrior. It's a UK FV-102 Striker. Um... There's a whole bunch more to do. Again, we won't do all of those vehicle types here because, again, we'd be here all day. But in all seriousness, let's just... Uh, let me do one more. Oh, actually kind of my favorite, at least among the uh, Scorpion line. If I can find it. Ah, the FV-107 Scimitar. It just looks badass. Now, this replaces that 76 millimeter cannon... Um, with, a, I think, a, a little bit of a better 30mm uh, automatic cannon, especially for the job that the striker is supposed Well, it's not the striker. This is going to be the uh, scimitar, uh, what with the, with the vehicle is supposed to do. So a 30mm automatic cannon, um, I believe it's 30mm. Um, it's, 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 a, it's a medium grade you know, automatic cannon. So it's going to get the same gunnery stats as the warrior did. Oh no, it's too high. Whoa, what the heck is that? I don't want to create a new text layer. I want to continue the text layer I already have. Okay, that is a star. It does not carry troops. Uh, there is another version of that, by the way. That is the FV-103 Spartan. So, again, I know that these vehicles kind of do all these different things. And sometimes, uh, I know I'm guilty of this. Uh, sometimes people will um, sort of conflate or merge the capabilities into one. Like, the Striker carries uh, troops. No, the Striker carries missiles. The Scimitar, which is what we have drawn here, carries a 30mm cannon. The Spartan carries troops. The uh, Scorpion carries a 76mm gun, and so on. Um, unfortunately, it does not have a uh, range of 20. Um, so again, that star means that it does not have to suffer a half firepower penalty when engaging soft targets because again auto cannon the scorpions 76 millimeter single shot cannon does suffer that penalty um okay so 20 no it's not 20 it is what do we give the warrior for range 10 roughly the same as uh actually no a little bit better than what the americans get with the bradley bradley's fire a 25 millimeter uh bushmaster so, I think I give it 6 and 8 for the Bradley. 
because the 30 millimeter gun is bigger and will shoot farther. Okay, still again with the four, and it's pretty fast uh, with the 14. And this is the FV 107 uh, scimitar, right? Uh, check my notes. Yep. And now we're going to go ahead and export this as well. Oh, see, I almost made a mistake. I tried to export it as a JPEG. You need it as a PNG. Here we go. Did I spell scimitar right? It's fine. Um, all right. So, uh, now that we have been streaming for about, uh, successfully, um, had a little bit of a rough start there, but we've been streaming for about 45 minutes or so. Let's try to, uh, let's have some fun, finally. You guys have eaten all your vegetables. Let's get to the dessert. You guys know what I'm talking about, probably. I'm talking about the Marine M60A3. Just kidding. Um, or M60A1, actually. Uh, where is this beast? That's the Abrams. I know I have it. There we go. Challenger. Challenger 1, that is. Alrighty. So, I believe the designation is the FE 4030. Actually, um, springtime, I may not have room to put Challenger uh, Mark V or Challenger 1 or Challenger 2. I'm, I'm already out of space here. Because <laughs> guess what? The Challenger gets a two-digit number for its defense. Surprise, surprise. Um, I don't think I'm going to have room to put the, any further information on here. Oh, man, look at this. Let me try to squeeze this text a little bit. All right, so what does the Challenger get, you ask? Well... Shit, let me tell you. Uh, these are the Challenger 1s, so we're still talking about the L11A5. It's a 55 caliber weapon. Uh, the British were using depleted uranium ammunition at this time. Um, not very much of it. They were very judicious with it. However, uh, the tanks were carrying it. Um, I can't remember the actual model number of the shell, but they did have one. Um, in the 1990s, they got... Uh, Really good electronics, the same as the Americans for the 1990s. Uh, 1.8 as far as a modifier goes. Um, they didn't carry as many Sable rounds. Also, their guns are rifled. That's going to slow the shell down. So that's the reason why there's a slight difference there, 1.4 to 1.6, uh, between the American gun. And, well, technically, it's a German gun, but built under license, it's the uh, M256. And other than that, they're both 120 millimeter weapons, so they have the same base number. The British do have an advantage um, with a 1.2 modifier for caliber. It's a, like I said, it's an L55 weapon. Whereas the Abrams, or the Leopard 2s, uh, to begin with, only had a L44 caliber weapon. The Germans have since come out with a 55 caliber weapon, so it's going to get uh, pretty good again. However, I think they're the only ones using it. And the trade-off is they want their shells to fly faster. The longer the gun, the faster your muscle velocity because the Germans refuse to use depleted uranium ammunition. So it kind of all comes out in the wash. The Americans, the M256, stick to the L44 weapon that fires deadlier ammunition, heavier metal. Uh, whereas the Germans use, I guess, either tungsten or hardened steel, something like that uh, for their penetrator rods. And, um, but firing with a higher muzzle velocity out of an L-55 gun. So uh, the L-11A5 winds up with a 51. We usually round that up to a 52. So I hate I hate round. No, I hate odd numbers. So we jump from an 8 to a 52. <laughs> an American Abrams in Germany, uh, the old 105 millimeter weapon, Fires like at a 36, I think it is, maybe a 40, um, with better electronics. The M1A ones that first came out, 
um, in the 1980s, so like your usual Team Yankee stuff, hits at about a 44 or a 46. Uh, by the time you get to the Gulf War, the Americans are usually hitting with 54s. Um, and then uh, nowadays, the uh, M1A2, the Challenger 2s, uh, with the uh, 2000s, 2010s, 2020s, um, ammunition types, and even more importantly, electronics, ballistic fire control computers. The M1A2 infamously has that dual engagement system for the commander. The gunner is engaging one target. The commander can already engage the second target um, with a, almost a separate fire control computer. And by the, as soon as that uh, sh uh, shell flies out of the muzzle, the turret automatically slaves over to the new target. Um, so you can have another round down range almost before your first round hits the target. And that's with the shell flying at six times the speed of sound. So again, it's a unit-based game. So it, I'm not going to say it doubles your firepower because that's that's absurd, but it uh, it's a huge plus. So by the time you get into the most modern tanks, the latest Leopard 2 A7s, um, the Challenger 2s, the latest versions of, versions of the Challenger 2s, and the uh, M1 A2 um, Cs and Ds, uh, C's basically what used to be the SEP4, SEP V4. You're looking at 56s to 60s uh, for engagement uh, engagement values here. Um, the British do like to use the Hesh round, high explosive squash head, so it does keep the uh, star for its uh, ammunition type. It can engage both side, both types of targets uh, equally well. The range is where it gets absurd. I usually give the Abrams and similar 120 millimeter armed tanks. Um, roughly like an 18, maybe a 20. Again, we're based on, that's roughly four kilometers away. Uh, the Challenger 2, sorry, the Challenger 1 in the Gulf famously scored the longest range tank kill ever recorded. Um, so I, uh, it's, that's anecdotal evidence at best, I realize that, but it's also a game, it's supposed to be fun. And, um, I do give the British a little bit of a weaker gun than the Americans, and that's going to cause some problems uh, in the community. So I sort of compensate by uh, giving them a longer range. The defense goes way up. Holy mackerel. Uh, what did I say for defense on this bad boy? Uh, Challenger gets a uh, defense of 36 star. Yeah, I'm, I'm out of space. <laughs> it's... it's... Oh my god, how am I going to fit this on there? This is terrible. Um, oof. This is awful. Alright, I'll have to figure something out. Uh, the speed does go down. Challengers are not as fast as Abrams. Okay. Yeah, that doesn't look good at all. All right, I'm going to have to really work on this here. Uh, oops. I didn't want to reduce it that much. <laughs> that still doesn't look good. All right, I'm going to have to compromise here a little bit. And move these numbers out a little. I need I need more elbow room. This kind of breaks my template. I'm not too happy about that. I won't lie. But I got to be able to fit the word challenger on there at least. All right. Uh, I'm not 100% sure if I'm in love with that. Um, the numbers are fine. I'm just not sure if I like the graphic design element of it. Uh, yeah. I'm not sure about that. I, we may revisit that later, but I won't torture you guys with it. Export as a BNG. Challenger one. All right. So what else are we looking at here? Um, have you considered the uh, second Korean War game? Um, I've considered it. We've done it, but not in this system. We've done it in Battle Carry Sabo. 
That was a game between Bill with the South Koreans, the K2 Black Panthers, and um, whatever uh, tanks the North Koreans had, the names escape me at the moment. We are not using the, um, the tanks the North Koreans claim to have. We're using the tanks that we've verified that they have. So some of their tanks that they've shown off in their military parades did not make an appearance. I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, so I guess the short answer is yes, we have uh, done it in the past, not in this system. Um, it's definitely a good idea though. Uh, that's definitely a war that could definitely happen. There would be a lot of tanks in that uh, in that campaign. We've done Korean War and Pan's Leader, but obviously chosen Reservoir, 1950. But for a speculative North versus South Korean War game, yeah, we've done it, but uh, in a different system. Battle Carry Sabo is a lot more skirmish focused. Each piece is an individual tank platoon. Oh, I'm sorry, an individual tank, not a platoon. And uh, it's more of a miniatures game, really. It's designed as a miniatures game. We play it virtually, but it can totally be played as miniatures as well. Uh, so Jen says, good memory. Johnson, Val Kilmer's character, Gallagher in Red Planet says, this is it. Okay, the moment they told us about in high school where one day algebra would save our lives. Jennifer Lemon also has uh, those 12 hour games sometimes come down to one die roll. That's very true. That nine and a half hour game of Pan's Leader on Gold Beach, it wasn't the last die roll, but it was the last turn. It was one of the last die rolls. Uh, the challenger gets whatever the challenger wants. Um, if it's arguing with T55s or Type 59-2s or um, you know similar Chinese knockoffs of uh, T55s and T62s, yep, challenger wins uh, at all times. Challenger does not need to go around fast. Uh, he lets you run away and hits you from four kilometers away. Yeah, the challenger will kill you at a distance. And you might outrun the challenger, but you're not going to outrun her gun. <laughs> That's for sure. All righty. So um, before the stream gets tedious, let's change it up a little bit. Don't need this anymore. Okay. Um, and we've got pieces for the MLRS, which the uh, which the uh, British had. Obviously, in the uh, Gulf War, we have. Um, the M109 Paladin. Um, so we got to squeeze that on there. That gun's really hard to fit on there. Um, all kinds of stuff. Again, I won't go through everything here, but uh, I'll be doing this a lot uh, tomorrow to get ready for the game. However, they do have the Lynx. So the Lynx is going to... Uh, what is that, the Western Lynx? I'll just put Lynx for now. Oh, it's the Lynx um, AH-1, I think. Or the AH-1 version is what I'm looking at here. All right, so the Lynx is going to get... Uh, I think it carries two 20mm cannon. I think those are single barrels. I'm pretty sure it's single barreled. So we are looking at a six... So it's basically a flying Bradley. Whoa, six. No, six... A star because they're automatic cannon and they have a range of six. Again, 250 meter hexes, so 1500 meters. Okay, so one other quick footnote for anyone who might not be aware the ranges in Panzer Leader do sound short, and they do so by purpose and by design. Again, this is not an individual vehicle shooting at another individual vehicle this is x or this is this is a firing unit or units it could be up to 30 or 40 tanks firing at another unit of targets it could be 20 or 30 targets or five it's at least five it, depending on how many units are in the stack it could be a maximum of 15 tanks so it's not you know and what the range sort of measures is at what range will the average shot from a targeted unit hit and realistically damage a average target on the enemy side. Um, and then it kind of puts all that together in a very rudimentary sort of data cube. You know, uh, you know, X 
shooter versus Y target over R range versus T time. Because again, it's like a six to 10 minute firing phase. And then it sort of measures that all out into a general effect, a battlefield combat effect on the unit. There is no role to hit in Panzer Leader ever. It's a unit based game. That's why we call it level two command tactical as opposed to level one skirmish um, as far as the scale of the game goes. Um, I'm not entirely sure how fast the Lynx is, but for now I'm going to give it speed equal to a Blackhawk faster than a uh, Cobra. So if I'm not correct about that, we can correct that later. Uh, spoiler alert, I've learned that it doesn't matter. Um, the boards are usually like 30 hexes by 20 hexes for a medium sized game. And once you have a movement of 50, you're pretty much teleporting around the map. So if you have a 40, 50, 55, or a 56 and a half, spoiler alert, it doesn't matter. The damn board is only 30 by 20. So it's, you know, <laughs> you can get anywhere on the board quickly. Um, I'm going to give it roughly the same amount of uh, protection as a Blackhawk. Again, I know it's more thinly armored or plated. The Blackhawk isn't really armored. It does have a little bit of plating. However, again, the Lynx, I believe, is a little bit faster, and it's definitely smaller. So I'm going to put those two factors together in my head and give it an equal uh, uh, defense rating. So that is, I have here on my chart, a uh, 16. Now, like I said, a Sherman battle tank and a Sherman tank in World War II has a defense of nine. A Tiger has a 12. A King Tiger has a 16. Clearly, the King Tiger is more heavily armored than a Lynx attack helicopter. Try to hit a Lynx attack helicopter with a tank gun, and let me know how that goes for you. So again, this is this defense factor. It's not an armor factor. It's a defense factor. It's how hard it is to affect combat results on a unit of these birds. And that's going to, uh, in this case, definitely be more of a, not can I damage the thing, it's going to be a lot more uh, can I hit the damn thing. Now, I believe some lynxes did carry guided missiles. So just to be on the safe side, I'm going to put a G there. And what that's going to do is uh, signify that the scenario rules might specify a one-shot missile load uh, with these lynxes. So we'll see what happens. Uh, export as PNG. Then we're going to uh, mix up and we're, we're going to fix that tornado because that tornado is not right. It had a number of a number of factors. A, no, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll put links AH-1. Because there's uh, 20 different versions of the links. All right. Now the Tornado has a different... Uh, It's obviously laid out a lot differently. So um, it's all one layer. As you can see over here on the background slide, the whole thing is one, uh, it's already one. So I'm gonna have to edit this one a little bit differently. And the reason I wanna edit it, I've made this piece up before, is I want to change how I do um, vehicles. So, or especially aircraft. So it's going to look like I am really nerfing this thing. I uh, trust me, I'm not. Okay, so the way it used to be, and it depends on like how you want to design your counters and what version of the game that you're playing. The way it used to be is this 30 was the missile shot, and this five was the cannon, and this is the defense. Movement, of course, is unlimited. Uh, the airstrike comes in, it hits the target and flies away, subject to enemy anti-aircraft fire. So that's kind of how it works. Again, this is one of the big changes in Arab-Israeli wars versus uh, uh, Panzer Leader 
in Panzer Leader, they don't even give fighters a defense because very few vehicles can shoot at them um, in World War II. Uh, in Arby's really worse, they changed that because there's Shilkas, there's SA2s, SA6s, SA8s later on. Uh, it becomes a problem. So you have to have an actual target number. All right, so the G, of course, means that it carries different ordnance, but uh, these tornadoes and other aircraft, the F-15 Strike Eagle, the A-10 Thunderbolt II, they can carry so many different payloads. I very, very quickly realized that it was absolutely pointless trying to make up counters for all of them. Because you, even if you could make up that many, which you could, um, you'd be lost as far as which one was which. So I just put a G on there that shows that this thing carries one use ground attack ordnance. Um, and that's going to be specified in the scenario rules. How many shots, what the attack class is, and what um, target class, sorry, what weapons class. It might not be G because there's also laser guided bombs and there's all other kinds of stuff like that. But we're just going to go ahead. There's also uh, dumb bombs. But it's usually G. They're usually carrying ground attack uh, guided missiles. So we're going to go ahead and stick with a G for now. And then slash A is going to be the, uh, the automatic cannon. So this number here, I'm not even going to try to um, enumerate the attack factor of the guided weapon. And we're going to go strictly with the... Uh, power of the gun it's a uh, rotary 20 millimeter weapon i think under the starboard wing so no worries there the problem is it only carries like 180 rounds so and it's designed mostly for air to air combat so it's not exactly a war dog it's gonna have a pretty weak uh pretty weak gun for strafing and that is going to be uh da -da -da -da. where do i have that written down six Oh no, I got the wrong font going here. All right, give me a second to find the right font. 58, I don't need to crush down to 65. Now it's like way too small. The choice of graphic design, folks. But this isn't really graphic design, this is more like production design. Let me not over glorify myself here. Okay, and the range on that I think is six. Because it's a 20 millimeter weapon. Um, cool. So rather than stress myself out, I'll just make another six. Put it on top of that five, get back down to my base layer, get my paintbrush back out. No, you're on the wrong color. And straighten that mess out. All right, cool. So yeah, I know it looks like I just nerfed the living hell out of this. Uh, trust me, I didn't. This, the main weapon of this Tornado is, think of it as being too big to fit on the counter. Uh, this G means it carries a ground attack ordinance. What values, ranges, and uh, weapon classes that ground attack ordinance uh, is involved with uh, is gonna be specified in the scenario rules. This is strictly the onboard gun which, if you'll notice, just got a little bit more powerful. Here's one thing that's definitely going to get more powerful, the defense. And I'll explain why in just a second. So when aircraft come on the table, they're obviously subject to anti-aircraft fire. One of the big systems that tornadoes... I know we pronounce this word tornado. I think the British pronounce it tornado. So if I'm mispronouncing that, I do apologize. I use the pronunciation of whoever owns the the plane. It's a British plane, I'll say a Tornado. When I'm talking about British armored vehicles, or especially British armored units, that is a proper noun. So when I'm writing out UK 1st Armored Division, that's the name of the unit. That's a proper noun. I put the U in there. Because um, it's a proper noun in the Queen's English. Or I guess now it's the King's English. Sorry about that. Alright, so we need a new defense factor. Uh, this is going to get cracked up to 30. The 30 is the speed of the plane. Because again, these planes aren't exactly armored. The speed of the plane, the altitude at which you can usually operate at, um, and probably most important of all, it's electronics. 
countermeasures, flares, and so on. So the reason I wanted to crank that up to at least a 30 is, and you know, if we look back to our Soviet stuff, uh, let me see if I can pump this up a little bit. Uh, there is some threats we have to deal with. Like the SA-8. This thing can attack a tornado at almost 2 to 1 with that old 24 value. 45 almost um, catches a 24 at 2 to 1. That's not good. And uh, even more importantly, the Shilka. So under the old defense class that I was giving the tornado, a Shilka can engage a tornado within 10 hexes at 1 to 1 odds. Which means it usually breaks up a tornado's attack. 4 out of 6 times, it's a 4 down on a D6. 4 out of 6 times, the Shilko will defend the target. Um, unless there's 2 Tornados. And if it rolls a 1, again, Panzer Leader, the lower the roll, the better. It's not like some games where the higher the roll is, the better. If it scores a 1, it will actually blow a Tornado out of the sky. I don't want that to really be an option. Not for a single platoon of Shilkos, or a single section of battery, I should say. A single battery of Shilkos. So, we wanted to crank up the defense on the Tornado a little bit. And now the tornado has been corrected, so I'm going to, again, re-export it. It already is a PNG. I'm just going to re-export it now, so it automatically... Uh... Yes, I do want to replace it. You guys get the idea of how we create uh, counters. Um, I'll do one more counter of a different type, just to kind of show like how we make these. And that is, not everyone's riding around in a vehicle. We do have infantry in this game. So um, I've seen that some people on Facebook actually put little troops on their counters. I stick with what was actually in the original game, which um, uses the usual NATO symbol. So again, these are templates. So this brown box, I can change this based on nationality. I can add a slight blue tint to it if I want to make Marine units, Royal Marine Commandos or something like that. I can change the color if I want to designate um, Special Forces or anything like that. But for now, this is just basic infantry. It comes with a uh, rectangular frame, so I can change that if I want. I probably usually don't. But the frame, again, is different. This is more of a graphic design thing. The frame is different than the box that it's sitting under. Oh no! Um, so that I can change the color of the box and not mess up the frame. Photoshop is all about layers. And what I accidentally just showed you, we can talk about that super fast, is American camouflage pattern, the chocolate chip of 1991. Underneath that is American World War II, and that looks like about it. Some of these templates have like 20 layers of stuff. Um, you know, American Marine camouflage scheme, mid-war, uh, World War II. Late War, 2002. Um, the green uh, four-color NATO stuff they were, we were wearing in the 80s. The chocolate chip that we see here in 1991 Gulf War. Um, the multicam that they were wearing, they were wearing later in, uh, in history. So we can get really specific uh, in our templates. And uh, once you create a template and you add enough layers to it, again, working with Photoshop is all about the layers, you actually get pretty damn good at... Uh, you know, mass producing uh, units to a very, very particular uh, standard. Um, three dots over the unit, again, marks it at, oops, um, designates it as a platoon. I'm going to take this, three dots, I'm going to, to duplicate it. Now I've got two groups of three dots, except one of them is going to get knocked down to two dots because there is such a thing as a section. So usually the game doesn't go down to section level, but once in a while you get special things like heavy weapon sections, mortars, command elements, um, anti-aircraft or SAM units, uh, things like that. So sometimes you'll have two dots over a unit um, and sometimes you'll have three that marks a platoon. In this case, we're talking about a platoon. So it's straight out British infantry, the PBI. PBI gets an I weapons class, and that's not as bad as it sounds. I class in Arab-Israeli wars after like 19, I think it's 1970, um, changes. Because little things like the law, the RPG, grenade launchers, 
so on and so forth. The long story short is, no matter what your range is, once you get an I class, uh, cla an I class attack factor, even if you're only I, you get to attack armored targets at range out to two hexes, so 500 meters, 300 to 500 meters, depending on what size hexes you're playing. And again, that's your laws, your Carl Gustavs, um, your uh, RPGs, you know, things like that. Not your man-carried Milans, your uh, dragons, your, in modern times, your javelins. Those are in their own sections. Because that requires a G armor class, and that, that's a, a long-range weapon. That's a whole different thing. But um, infantry tend to get eight, because everyone's carrying an automatic or semi-automatic rifle. Two star. Okay, so what the star means, this is a Panzer Leader rule. So it's got a range of, you know, 500 meters. Um, this is what we trained at in the U.S. Marine Corps. This is what most armies train at today. Uh, by this time, I think the British were using the L-85 um, individual weapon. So, again, everyone had made the switch over to 556 NATO ball for their standard ammunition type. The range is, at best, 500 meters. Really. I know the maximum range is some absurdly high number, but... You can't hit much with an M16 or a similarly chambered weapon uh, past 500 meters or so. The bow just loses its ballistic stability at that point. However, you'll see that it carries a star effort. That star means that there are some weapons in this platoon. Again, this is about 40 or 45 men. There are some men in this platoon that are carrying um, the FN mag. I believe the British called it like the L7A2 general purpose machine gun there are some guys that might still be walking around with the fn uh i think you guys call it the slr uh it's the fn uh, fall um belgian um battle rifle fired a larger 7.62 millimeter round um i don't i think you guys have gotten rid of the two inch mortar by this time but long story short take your whatever shot there are certain weapons in this platoon that can engage at longer ranges than 500 meters so what the star means in game terms is very simple. It means that you get to fire out to half your attack factor at double your range. So this unit's normal attack is eight out to two hexes, or it can fire four out to four hexes. And it gets access to that rule if it has this little star. Uh, they used to call it the MG42 rule um, in Panzer Leader. Basically, German units would walk around with enough MG42s where... Holy hell, man. They would put out a decent amount of firepower out to a, uh, a pretty good range. No human is tougher than any other human when it comes to getting hit by bullets, so the defense factor here is more about unit cohesion. And 8 is the standard for a Western-trained army. This comes out of Israelis. Uh, the Israelis and Arab-Israeli wars. And what's probably going to be a little bit of a change for some people who play a lot of Panzer Leader is I give all my infantry units a speed of 2. Holy crap, all my guys are marathon runners. Not really. Um, I give my guys a movement of 2 because I usually, not always, I usually play with 150 meter hexes instead of 250 meter hexes. For a whole bunch of reasons that I won't bore everybody to tears with today. But... Um, it fixes a lot of problems. This is also where we're dividing the movement rate by three instead of by five to get like better movement rates. And again, it turns into a mess. So I won't get into it, but usually I play with smaller hexes. So the infantry speed has to be cranked up to match. And then that's infantry. There's also going to be a heavy weapons team. There might be uh, like man, uh, man portable Milan teams. There might be man pad sections. There's going to be uh, headquarters sections, engineers, stuff like that. And it all, you know, fits on the same uh, general template. Very glad they decided to turn off the concrete drill downstairs. About half an hour before the stream was scheduled to start, our downstairs neighbor was having some work done on their house. 
And um, it's like living inside a dentist's office. This, this hammer drill was just cutting into the concrete at the base of their house and was just shivering through the bones of the building. And the hell yeah, the mic was picking it up. All right, guys, uh, we've been up now for about just short of an hour and a half. We're going to cut this short here pretty soon. Um, this is also where we draw our maps. Again, I'm not going to get super into it, but because uh, we're kind of running low on time. We probably won't have any marsh. The biggest battle that uh, the British fought in the Gulf War, it starts off like day one. Uh, Wadi El uh, Batir, I think it was called. Um, it was sort of, they had already punched through the Saddam line, made the pivot to the uh, uh, to the east, and were now approaching Kuwait out of the west. And where they were crossing uh, the border out of southern Iraq and back into. So they jumped out of Saudi Arabia, they invaded Iraq, and then they pivoted back um, eastward to attack the Iraqi occupation army in Kuwait uh, from the flank. So it's mostly, again, a west to east action. And along that border, uh, the uh, western Kuwaiti border, you're going to see, uh, I get what they call it, I think it was Wadi al -Batin. And that is where you've got um, basically a wadi. Uh, it's like a dry riverbed, sort of. And some berms, some uh, some chain link fences. It wasn't a very secure border. It's out in the middle of the desert. Um, so we'll have some of those terrain features on there. I don't know if we'll have these. Aren't really swamps. Uh, these are these are swamps. But on a desert table, they're usually interpreted as some sort of a salt marsh or something like that, or like loose sand. Uh, I don't want to say quicksand, but some kind of sand that tanks don't like. So they, they have to avoid those. Um, there, I don't think there'll be any train tracks. There weren't really any rail lines out that way. Um, there weren't any streams. We're going to turn this into, uh, basically, oh, I haven't done it yet. I meant to change the color on these. Um, uh, I can do that now. Come on, give me my brown. Give me a nice... Muddy, nasty, sloppy brown here. All right, so um, I guess long story short, that you know, that's still kind of green. I don't want it to be green. Yeah, keep it brown. There you go. It's kind of a uh, of a of a brown. Um, so that's what a wadi looks like in Pangeliter, and it's just a different color. This is a stream. So it's a stream bed that actually has water in it, and then a stream bed that doesn't have water in it. Um, they kind of uh, have the same effect in Pangeliter, um, or I should say, on desert boards, they have the same effect. In European Pangeliter, when you're playing in Normandy. And battlefields like that, streams become a much bigger obstacle because of the nature of the waterways in that part of the world. So we'll get into that. We also put elevation in here. Again, we're kind of running low on time on the stream, so I won't get into it now. But um, basically, I get my pen out. This is an actual stylus pad now. And if I can get it to work on this computer, that would be lovely. Okay, there we go. Oop, that's not what I meant. We're going to turn off these effects for now. All right, so, oh my god, the mountain just disappeared. Just so we can see it, we're going to change it to a different filter. Okay, now we, we can kind of see what we're drawing. And you pretty much just draw your hill wherever you want it. I'll make this my pen a little bit bigger. So you got to be careful that you know the, that it matches your your grid lines, and you don't have any bad hexes like that right there. 1209, that's a bad hex because you can't tell whether it's high elevation or low elevation. Um, you want to make sure that your map is very clear. So you want to make sure that that dot, that central dot that determines that governs the rules in the hex, re it's really clear whether or not it's. Uh, 
on high ground or low ground. Now, a lot of the battlefields um, in the Gulf War were very, very flat. Um, however, some of them weren't. 73 Easting uh, famously takes place on uh, the reverse slope of a low ridge. And uh, at Wadi al -Batir, again, you're also going to see, that's kind of a dull looking hill. And again, I'm not going to keep this, but just to kind of show you guys how it works. And you fiddle around with it and you play around with it until you get it the way you want. You turn this back to saturation for its filter. It's going to seem to disappear. Trust me, it's still there. And we re-add the effects. So stroke is an outline. You see a very thin brown outline there. And then drop shadow. Please give me my drop shadow. Oh, I'm on the wrong layer. There we go. Now that drop shadow probably needs a little bit of help. It's not really clear enough. So I might come in here and um, make it a little bit darker so it's easier to tell. And make it a little bit bigger. Did that make a difference? All right, so maybe now the hills are a little easier to see. And we, you would put your hills, and if there's multiple elevation levels on your map, you just stack them on top of each other. And after that, it's just a little bit of patience. You put in your buildings. I have a whole bunch of building uh, assets already kind of built in here. Um, so you see them appearing. And because they're separate layers, you can put them wherever you want. So I want some wooden buildings here. If you want to get artistic with it, uh, you can kind of make sure that the road runs through the town rather than like right through the buildings. Um, the ones that are colored gray are concrete buildings. And the rules are very different for those. So that's the reason why we have two different colors of uh, urban hexes. Because wooden buildings and stone slash concrete buildings tactically have different properties, clearly. And then, yeah, you just keep playing around with it, moving around these little assets, drawing your uh, roads, drawing your hills, you know, splashing trees. There won't be very many trees, obviously. Um, but yeah, you can move your trees around, you can put them wherever you want. And before you know it, you're going to have a map. So these are the kind of maps that we see in all of our Sunday War Games. And that's pretty much how that part of it works. All right, guys. So um, unless anybody else has any comments or questions... We're going to go ahead and call it for tonight. Uh, we've been up for about an hour and a half. That was kind of all I really wanted to stream for. So hopefully um, uh, you guys got something out of it. I'm actually surprised we had as many people as we did for a surprise stream late at night. It's Friday night, guys. We need to all like go out and get a life. Uh, I'm just kidding. I'm right here with you guys, so I'm not making fun of anybody. Um, but yeah, that's how you make um, gaming units. It's the same basic... Uh, system graphic design process for any war game um, i'm making up uh naval counters for further games of naval war so i can play that virtually as opposed to on a tabletop um we are uh talking about getting hk ops started again so we have virtual counters for that basically miniatures for your character um they're very similar to the ones that we use for um sit rep skirmish we also do this for Battle Carry Sabo and for any Hex Encounter game. We usually make up our counters virtually. If anybody is really serious about it, you can take these. I try to make them available either in Discord or um, on my Google Drive. I'll send you the link to it if you're super interested in it I, I, once I finally finish it. And then you can splice them together uh, on your time, to be perfectly honest. Uh, I'm not going to do it because I don't use these counters physically. And you can make up a more traditional um, kind of a, uh, let me see if I can find an example here, more of a traditional kind of uh, counter sheet. So something like this. This is what most people are interested in. Um, they, um, they take this, they print them out, uh, and then they mount them on some sort of cardboard, and then they, uh, you know, they play with them on a physical, on, a, on an actual physical map board. Um, it definitely works if you want to go through the motions of actually, now you need, you know, 50 copies of, well, not 50, but you need many, several dozen at least copies of 
every unit type and um, it gets to be a, a little bit of a pain. Especially since you have to physically mount them to some kind of cardstock and then physically mount them and physically cut them. Um, and if you've never cut, uh, a, you know, a couple dozen counter sheets, uh, you haven't lived, man. I mean, it's like the most boring thing that you could possibly do in connection to Hex Encounter Wargaming. Not only that, but you will kill your hand. Um, so that's going to be up to you guys. Um, I don't. I make up one version of each unit. And again, some of my libraries are pretty, ex are pretty extensive. Uh, my Russians go on for days. And this isn't even uh, the biggest one. I won't get into all of them, but um, some of them get, get pretty intense. And the good news is, once you create it, you've got it on file, and uh, you can use it whenever you want. All right, guys. So we're going to go ahead and... Uh, Holy crap, that was six apartments away. Wow. Holy mackerel. It sounded like it was right under my feet. I was going to start stomping my feet on the floor. Tell them to shut up. I'm glad I didn't because I would have agitated the wrong people. That sounded like it was literally in the next room. I can't even imagine. Okay. Damn. Damn. All right, guys, that's going to wrap up our stream for today. Again, Tango Mike for watching. We are rounds complete. Uh, we hope to see these counters in action in a small um, demo game of how Panzer Leader works in the modern system because we just want to get back to more modern gaming. Panzer Leader and its you know cousin games, its, uh, its related games, uh, always do very well on our streams. They also do very well on various Facebook groups and in our Discord. So again, if you're interested, join our Discord. The link is in the description of this video. Um, and uh, yeah, we hope to see you guys on Sunday. Uh, I'll publish out what time the stream is going to start. Uh, and so we're actually going to put these tanks up against some Iraqi tanks and have a bit of a shootout. Um, spoiler alert, uh, the British are, are definitely going to win um, because their tanks are just absurdly superior to what they're going up against. Um, also the troops in the tanks. However, the game gets bounced asymmetrically so that if the British lose like a single tank troop, they've probably lost the game. There's also engagement rules that um, Tactical Command Middle East puts into it. You can't fire tanks into buildings or the damage of your tank gun counts as Iraqi victory conditions. That also goes for oil wells. You can't just start shooting up the infrastructure we're trying to keep the damage and the civilian body count down, obviously. Uh, world opinion is definitely a thing in modern warfare. So even though you've got the coolest toys, you've definitely got to cool your jets a little bit when it comes to shooting around civilians. Uh, especially since we're going to be crossing the border into Kuwait. So now you're shooting at ostensibly friendly civilians, the people you're trying to liberate. So, you know, you got to be cool with it. All these things serve to counterbalance a game where Obviously, all the tactical advantage rests with the coalition forces. Uh, in this case, 1st British Armored Division, specifically 7th Armored uh, Brigade. So we're going to go ahead and call it, guys. Thanks very much again. We'll see you again, hopefully, on Sunday. Until then, take care and enjoy your weekend, and we'll be in touch very soon. Take care, everybody, and thanks again.